Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make myself a little bit more comfortable, if you don't mind. You know, you're very brave. Very brave to invite a uh, pulpit rabbi to give a keynote address. And uh, some rabbis are notorious for not knowing when to stop. There was a rabbi who was giving a sermon, and this guy walks out down the center aisle in the middle of the drosha. And afterward, his davening, the wife of that guy comes up to the rabbi to apologize for her husband's behavior. And she says in her apology, Rabbi, please don't be offended by my husband. He always walks in his sleep. There was another guy who walked out in the middle of the drosha, and the rabbi actually stopped him midway. He says, where are you going? He said, I'm going to have a haircut. He said, a haircut now? Why didn't you have one before? He says, I didn't need one before your drosha. So I know the hour is late, but uh, don't worry. I won't keep you that long. But I did think that we could fabreng through Gimel Thomas starting now, you know. Gimel Thomas... 1994, and the whole world, I think, thought that Chabad Lubavitch would collapse. It would no longer be a movement of any significance. The Rebbe was such a powerful personality, so unique, so singular, so everything. What would become of Chabad without the Rebbe physically at our side? So what happened? It's remarkable. The opposite. The exact opposite happened. Yatir mi bechayehu. The Rebbe's influence on the world today is more than it has ever been before, and it continues to grow. I'll share with you a personal experience at the Kinnas HaShluchim in New York, the annual convention. You know, when you're uh, living in South Africa, you're not always able to go every single year necessarily. Sometimes I had uh, big events of chasenes uh, of people very close to me that didn't ask me about the date before they booked it, and I couldn't go. So I couldn't make it every single year. It just doesn't work out. In 2002, I think, yeah, I was honored to give the keynote address at the Kinnas HaShluchim. But it was around 2000, after not having attended the Kinnas for a couple of years, I had the famous roll call that my dear brother-in-law, Rabbi Katlarski, is all gesund sein does the roll call, and seeing for the first time, I was seeing now for the first time, how many hundreds of shluchim went out on the Rebbe Shlichus after Gimel Thomas. You know, he asks everybody to go up the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And I saw standing up hundreds of young light, hundreds of young shluchim. There were already more people who had gone out on shluchus after Gimel Thomas than had gone before. And I pushed it, cried when I saw that with my own eyes. I was overcome by the emotions of seeing with my own eyes the fulfillment of the Gemara's words, Yaakov Avinu Loimes, the Gemara in Tainus. Yaakov Avinu did not die. And the Gemara there asks, what do you mean Yaakov Avinu did not die? Did they bury him alive? Did they have a mock funeral there going from Cairo to Hebron? Did they embalm a living person? Did they, make, did they make eulogies for the living? And the Gemara says, no, that's not what we mean. What does it mean, Yaakov Vinu Lameis? Mazaroi Bachayim, Avhu Bachayim, just like his children are alive, so is he alive. And so we read in Pashas Vayechi, the end of Yaakov's Life. By Yechal Yaakov Litzavah, says Bonov, he finished giving his last will and testament, his ethical will to his children. By Yosef, 
‫רגלו ולמיתו ויגבה ויאוסף אל עמוב. Yaakov finished speaking to his sons, he drew his feet into the bed. Vayigva, some translate, and he expired. Some say he breathed his last, and he was gathered unto his people. And the commentaries discuss this. It doesn't actually say anywhere in the Chumash, Vayomas Yaakov, like it says by the other of us. It doesn't say he died. It says Vayigva, he expired, he breathed his last. And the Gemara therefore concludes, just as his children are alive, so is he alive. So one can expire physically and still be vibrantly alive spiritually. And you could ask, weren't all the others holy? Why does the Gemara not say this about Avraham Avinu, about Yitzchok Avinu, why only Yaakov? The Rebbe points out in one of the Sikhs that Yaakov was Bechir HaOvos, the select of the forefathers, because mitosa shlema, all his children were complete, were righteous. Avram had Yitzchok as a son, but he also had Yishmol. And you here know better than anyone what kind of nachas we're having from Yishmol's descendants to this day. And Yitzchok had Yaakov, but he also had Esau, whose descendants destroyed our base Amikdash. And only Yaakov, all 12 shvatim, were righteous and followed in their father's footsteps. Indeed, Yaakov Ovinu Loimes, our father Jacob, never died. And so, my friends, when I saw that there are many more shluchim today who have gone out in the Rebbe Shlichas, who gave up their own fortunes and creature comforts and conveniences and the easy life for a life often far from their families and comfort zones and in the far-flung corners of the of the world, whether it's Asia or Africa or Siberia or the Ukraine or the furthest corners of the Holy Land or even sometimes at the heart of our eternal capital right here in Yerushalayim has its own challenges and more shluchim after Gimel Thomas than in all the previous decades during the Rebbe's physical lifetime I saw the meaning of the Gemara alive and it was worth shedding a tear. And so, my friends, we could ask, really, today. You don't have to be wild and radical. I'm a moderate guy. But is the Rebbe not alive? Do we not see the Rebbe's vital activity and influence in the world today more than ever before? What is living? What is alive? There are people who live in uh, old age homes, some are healthy, some are vital, some are happy, and some never schlep across the last years of their lives waiting from one meal to the next meal. It's very sad to see some of those people. They're alive physically, but that's not the life that they necessarily would like to be living. And here we see someone who is making a difference, a tangible difference in the world, literally changing the world from the next world. And today we have young couples who never even saw the Rebbe in person who are dedicating their lives to his holy mission, and it's quite remarkable. And so, Mazarai Bachayim, Avhu Bachayim. And it's beautiful to behold the strides made by Chabad around the world in recent years. I remember when Chabad was a fringe group, fringe movement. People didn't take it so seriously. They couldn't even pronounce it, you know, Shabbat. Today, Baruch Hashem, Chabad is ma as mainstream as they come. Without changing our values, our principles, our style, the world finally came to recognize the power of Chabad, the value of Chabad, and a Chabad is at the forefront of every situation everywhere around the world. You know, my wife and I recently, not so long ago as Pesach, we had the interesting experience of being invited to be scholars and residents at a very big uh, kosher hotel experience in a place called Cancun, Mexico. And Ambassador Ron Dermer, who was, now lives in Yerushalayim, he was the Israeli ambassador to Washington some years ago. He was also one of the guest speakers along with us. And he said as follows. He said, you know, once upon a time, countries that were friends of Israel were friends out of compassion, kindness almost Rachmonis, 
on Israel. Or they had a guilt complex from the Holocaust or whatever. Today, he says, Israel is no longer a Rachmonis case. The world has new respect for Israel with all its developments on every level. Today, it's not out of compassion, but out of necessity. The world needs Israel. Baruch Hashem. And today, in a similar way, the Jewish world realizes that it needs Chabad. And after Tzahal, Israel's army, the next biggest Jewish organization in the world is the Rebbe's army. And please God, may it continue to grow. Now the Rebbe was the greatest Torah scholar. There was not a part of Torah that he did not touch on. They did not expound on, they did not teach. Not just like the Rosh Hashivas, they know the, the Yeshiva Shemesechtis, they say. The Rebbe touched on every single chalik of Torah. I studied in Montreal in my Yeshiva days. The Rosh Hashiva was Rav Pinchas Hirschprung, who was, who was uh, one of the greatest Bekiim in, in Shas and, 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 and everything. You stopped him in the street, he would ask you, was Lernste? And you would say, what daf you're learning? And he would rattle off the page by heart. The first time he went to Yechidus, we encouraged him to go to, he was a student of Chachmei Lublin. The first time he went to the Rebbe, he came back, he told us, we said, how was it by the Rebbe? He says, Halb Shas. We spoke with the Rebbe, he and the Rebbe, Halb Shas, half of Shas, we went through in that Yechidus. I assure you that the Rebbe would have loved to do nothing more than to study Torah himself day and night. We already have dozens of svarim of the Rebbe's Torah. But he gave up his precious time that he could have used to delve into Torah to his own spiritual satisfaction. He gave it all up to care, to love, to nurture, to lead us all in the right direction, to see tens of thousands of people privately over the years, to answer hundreds of thousands in writing, to teach Torah and Yiddishkeit and what Hashem wants of us to millions. And he dedicated his life to rebuilding the Jewish world. When he became the Rebbe, he was a young man. And it was just a few years after the Holocaust. And he dedicated his life to rebuilding the Jewish world after World War II. They tell a story of a guy who uh, would do what the Rebbe spoke about. The Rebbe used to tell people that you know, it was a custom in America any Jews had this minhag. Before they went to shul, in the morning, they had to read the New York Times over a glass of orange juice. That was an American Jewish minhag. The Rebbe decried it, you know. He sort of laughed about it sometimes. So this guy's reading the New York Times, and he's flipping the pages, and he comes to the obituary page. And he's shocked. He sees his own name on the obituary page. He looks at the, at the bio, it's him. He calls up the editor of the New York Times, he says, excuse me, I demand a retraction, a correction, an apology. You've got me on the obituary page, I'm alive and well. The editor says, sir, the New York Times does not make mistakes. He says, here I am, I'm, talk I'm not talking to you from the other world, I'm here, down the road. You've got to make an apology, a correction. He says, sir, the New York Times did not make mistakes. We cannot issue an apology or correction, but what I can do for you is in tomorrow's paper, we can put your name in the birth column. The world had already written the obituary of the Jewish people. Hitler, Yamach Shemoy, had plans for a museum in Prague, which was gonna be the museum of the extinct Jewish species the Jewish race, chas v'sholem, chalila v'chas, six million times. And so the Rebbe sought to send his students all over the world to rebuild the Jewish world, as Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, all of a sholem, a blessed memory, famously said, as the Nazis hunted down every last Jew in hate, the Rebbe taught us to search and seek out every lost Jew in love. There are some younger people here who might not remember a guy named Moshe Dayan, so the older ones will tell them, eh? 
So Moshe Dayan was once driving. Even with his black patch on the one eye, he still drove. And, you know, he was a Heverman, so he was speeding. And guess what? He gets stopped by an Israeli traffic cop. And the cop sees one look at the driver, and it's unmistakable face of Moshe Dayan with his black patch. He says, Adoni, I know who you are, but I'm giving you a ticket anyway. You, of all people, should show a better example. So Moshe Dayan says to the traffic cop, he says, you know, you see I have one eye. Do you want me to look at the road or the speedometer? The Rebbe never looked at the speedometer. The Rebbe was not impressed by the scientific surveys, by the, the Pew reports of what is the future likely for the Jewish people, of how few Jews will be left in a few years. Let's go back a few years to 1967. Erev, the Six-Day War. I was present on Eastern Parkway at the Lagboima Parade, and the Rebbe was addressing thousands of Jewish children a few short weeks before the Six-Day War. Lagboima is in May, this is early June, Mamish, maybe three weeks before. And Nasser of Egypt and Syria and Jordan are all massing their troops on our borders. And the whole Jewish world was petrified. God forbid, another Holocaust? I saw video film clips of Rav Shloy Megoran with Parks Department, people from Israel, identifying which parks could, God forbid, have to be used as cemeteries because there won't be enough expecting such tragedies, Nebuch. And the Rebbe was the lone voice of confidence in the world at that time. Parents... Whose, student, whose children were studying in yeshivas and universities in Israel, parents in America brought their children home. There's going to be a war. And parents who, in the Chabad community who had children studying in Kfar Chabad asked the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, Chas v'sholem. They must remain in Israel. There will be an outstanding victory. The Rebbe was the only voice of confidence, and it was in the newspapers here in Israel. And indeed, as we know, there was a great victory. Fast forward 1991, the first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein, remember him? George Bush Sr., remember him? And the Rebbe's promise that Israel was the safest place in the world. I saw a video of Sunday Dollars by the Rebbe shortly before the first Gulf War began. Everybody was, again, worried. There were emergency meetings and, and things all over the world for Israel. Saddam Hussein was threatening to, to chemical warfare against Israel. Israel distributed gas masks to all its citizens. Rav Wrightport, the big guy in New York, goes by the Rebbe on Sunday for dollars and says his son is due to get married in a short time in Israel. They say there's going to be a war. Maybe we should move the chasana to New York, where the chasana lives instead of the kala. The Rebbe gives him a dollar and says, For you should give the tzedakah in Israel. He thought maybe the Rebbe didn't hear him, so he said it again. The Rebbe gave him another dollar. He says, please give the tzedakah in Israel. For everything's cool. I'm paraphrasing the Rebbe, of course. So, I'm about to give a sermon Friday night in the Sydney Shul. There's maybe a thousand people in Shul. And I'm preparing a powerful, heartfelt, sincere, faithful drosha that people should not worry that it's going to be okay, that the Rebbe, who's never been wrong, promised us that Israel will be safe, and I'm sitting in my seat, in the rabbi's seat in the shul, and there's a little door near my seat. And one of my congregants opens the door, pokes his head in. He had just heard the six o'clock news. Kabbalah Shabbos starts at six o'clock by us. He had just heard the six o'clock news, and he tells me, Rabbi, on the news I just heard that Iraq 
fired Scud missiles on Israel. He doesn't know what the results were. That's all he knows. As Chatoya and Imaskir Hayoim, I have a confession to make. I didn't know what to do. Must I give the sermon that I prepared? This powerful, faithful sermon, everything's cool? Here he just told me three scuds were fired. You know how big a scud is? The size of this room. I don't know what the results are, God forbid. I'm going to give a, a sermon, a powerful sermon of Emunah and Betochen, and then they'll hear the 7 o'clock news. God knows what they're going to hear. And I had Sveikas. What do I do? Do I give the drosha as is? Do I say to the Gaboy, I'm sorry, I have laryngitis, no drosha today? Or do I run to my office and go to my files and find an old drosha on the Parsha? <laughs> Thank God my emuna prevailed and I gave the drosha as planned. And thank God, from those three scuds, nothing happened. And from 39 scuds that Iraq fired on Israel, there were 39 miracles and not one Jew was hurt. One scud hit an American base in Saudi Arabia years ago and dozens were killed. I went afterwards with the Rebbe's uh, blessing. I joined the South African Zionist Federation Solidarity Mission to Israel during that first Gulf War. I stood on the rubble of a house in Ramat Gan that had been flattened completely by a scud from Iraq. It was a lone page from a sitter in the rubble which I took out to put into Seamus. Borah Hashem, Nobody was home. Nobody was hurt. And 39 times, that same miracle repeated itself. Back to 1967, at that parade on Lag Boimer, a few short weeks before the Six-Day War, the Rebbe not only said things will be good, it'll be a great victory, he said we should be part of it, and he launched Mivtza Tfilin, the Tfilin campaign. And he quoted the the nation of the world will see the name of God called upon you and they'll be afraid of you. Omar Rabbi Lezer HaGodl, Rabbi Lezer the Great says in the Gemara in what does it mean the name of God upon you? Elu Tfilin Sheberosh. It refers to the Tfilin that we wear on our head. That's the name of God upon you. It has the Shin, the initial of Hashem's name. And indeed we talk a saw the great miracles of the Six-Day War, how they feared us, how the Egyptian army fled, left their tanks and their boots behind, behind and ran for their lives. Now, there were some rabbis at the time who disagreed with this idea, I must tell you. Tefillin are sacred objects. You don't just put them on any uh, Tom and Jerry, you know? How could you uh, put on Tefillin on that guy? Do you know where he just came from? Do you know where he's going? The rabbi said it doesn't matter. A Jew is a Jew. And a mitzvah is a mitzvah. And any Jew doing any mitzvah has eternal value. Yes, this one mitzvah might light a fire, which will eventually result in a total transformation, halavai. But even if not, it is a viable mitzvah. It is valuable. It is precious. Especially a karkafta, someone who never wore tefillin. But even if not... Every mitzvah is a standalone good deed because every yid is precious and it doesn't matter if he's religious or not. And in fact, the Rebbe said more than once, we don't really know who is religious. So while some people may have had objection to the tefillin campaign back then, those objections have long fallen by the wayside and everybody's doing it today. Baruch Hashem. The Rebbe did not look for a monopoly on these things. He wanted the world to follow. The Rebbe taught us the intrinsic value of every single mitzvah. No matter who, no matter how, no matter where, not only at the Kotel, where it's a, a factory of people putting on film. We were there today. It's beautiful to behold. But five minutes on 47th Street in Manhattan, on an airplane, in a shopping mall, at the bottom of Africa, wherever. And a few years later came the mitzvah tanks which was a new 
shlav, a new level. Because here, we're actually going on the offensive. We're not waiting for people to come on the shul, the shul, or people to come and meet us or to bump into someone. We're going out onto the streets. We're going out onto the front lines to find people. Avi kindly mentioned my radio program that I ran for 24 years in South Africa, The Jewish Sound, as a project of Chabad House. It started back in 1976, within three months of my landing in South Africa, a weekly hour every evening. And back then, as he mentioned, there were some older rabbis who did not approve of such a thing. A rabbi on the radio? Feh. As pasnet, it was unbecoming for a rabbi, they thought. The rabbi actually took a very keen interest in my radio program. On a number of occasions, his chief secretary, Rabbi Kharakov, asked me how the radio program was going. And from that, I derived that the Rebbe was interested. Because with radio, you could reach people even further. And I had many experiences and many cards and letters from people over the years from all places where they were able to pick up the program on shortwave and medium wave and so on. A non Lubavitch Chosid once came to see the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, Won't you share with me a word that you heard recently from your Rebbe? So he thought for a minute and he said, Yeah. There's a Gemara at the end of Chagiga, famous Gemara which says, Poisha Yisrael Meleim Mitzvis Kerimoin. That the sinners of Israel, are filled with mitzvahs like a pomegranate is filled with seeds. So my Rebbe asked, said this non-Chabad Chosid to, to the Rebbe, if they are wicked sinners, Poshim, how can they be filled with mitzvahs? And the Rebbe responded as follows. He says, that's interesting. I too have a question on that Gemara. My question is a little bit different. If the Gemara says they are full of mitzvahs, why do they call them sinners? Just the opposite. Because the Rebbe loved every Jew regardless. I have a friend in Johannesburg, Rabbi David Chazdan, Shliach Rov, Dean of our Torah Academy schools. He officiated at the funeral of the husband of a famous woman in South Africa. I don't know if you heard of her. Her name was Helen Sussman. She was a member of parliament for many years in the old apartheid regime. She was a lone voice of democracy and human rights. She visited Nelson Mandela in prison. And her husband died and Rabbi Chazdan did the funeral and he went to the house to do prayers. And as he's walking into Helen Sussman's house, she was very liberal politically, but she was also very liberal religiously. And she stops the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I must be honest with you, I don't believe in God. And Rabbi Chazdan had siyata de shmai and he answered her immediately. He says, that's okay, Helen. I don't believe in atheists. And we don't. We believe that every Yid believes. Maybe they're not in touch with their own belief, but it's there. Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael Steinzal Tzolova Sholem told the story of, he used to give a weekly shir at the Hebrew University, but there was one professor who refused to attend his shir. In fact, he told the rabbi defiantly, I'm not coming to your shir. In fact, I eat chazer every single Shabbos. He was a Holocaust survivor. He was obviously very angry. And Rabbi Adin said to him, well, you are clearly a believer and you're keeping Shabbos. You keep it a little differently than we do, but you're keeping Shabbos in your own way. The guy says, what are you talking about? He says, why do you eat chazer on Shabbos? Why not eat it on Wednesday? And why dafka chazer? Why don't you have uh, lobsters on Wednesday, you know? You're eating chazer on Shabbos. You're making a point that there's such a thing called Shabbos and there's such a thing called kashras. You're a believer. He was a professor, so he was intellectually honest, and he had to think about it, what he just heard. And to his credit, he had to admit 
that the rabbi had a point. And he rethought his position and he came to the shir and he transformed his life. We believe in Kiruv to every Yid, even the most seemingly alienated, distant, non-practicing cynic. So please, my dear friends here in Yerushalayim, I know it's not easy. I know they may exasperate you at times, but please, I beg of you, don't give up on those so-called chilonim. They are our brothers and sisters, and they too are precious. You know, I could tell you stories about South Africa, but the Rebbe had a very special relationship with Eretz Yisrael, we know. To a lesser extent, he also had a special relationship with us in South Africa. I've written an article which was published in one of our Jewish magazines, how the, the man who saved our community. The Rebbe saved South African Jewry. When we came in 76, Jews were telling us, are you crazy? Are you mad? You're Meshuggah. What did you come here for? We're all leaving. We're sitting on a volcano. The pol political situation is, 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 can blow up any second. The rest of Africa, when the locals overthrew their colonial rulers, there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of violence in the streets. And many Jews were leaving en masse. The Rebbe told us it will be good for Jews in South Africa until the coming of Mashiach. After Mashiach, it will be even better. And Baruch Hashem, we still have a community. It's smaller than it was, and people are still leaving, I must say. South Africans have a suitcase at the bottom of their beds. But please God, our community, which is growing stronger in quality, will continue to exist and to flourish. My wife and I are very proud that we have six children in South Africa, in Johannesburg and Cape Town, rabbis, rabbitsons, community activists, who are all con contributing in one way or another to the community. And today in Johannesburg, while there are Jews leaving, there are four new building projects going on right now in Chabad in South Africa. In, Tarek, in, in Johannesburg, there's a new girls' high school being built where Devara Kay was a senior educator for many years. A new shul campus and mikveh for the younger generation of Chabad families, which is a growing community, growing exponentially. A new outreach Chabad house in Hyde Park, Johannesburg. And a new student center for the university students in Cape Town by Chabad on campus there. This girl's high school that's being built, there's a big billboard outside it. It says as follows. We cannot predict the future, but we can build it. And we are. Because we believe in the Rebbe's promise for our community. Now, it's not yet Shabbos. But you know, you can't keep a pulpit rabbi away from the parsha for too long. So I must share with you something. You know, in South Africa, we're still behind. We're in Parshas Koirach. But you're doing Parshas Chukas. And one of the famous stories in this parsha is the story, the tragedy of Moshe and the rock. The harsh punishment he received for a seemingly minor misdemeanor of hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock. I mean, if I got water out of a rock by hitting it, it would be a big miracle and everybody would, would shout, Moshe manach nuloch. Moshe gets the water out miraculously, but he's punished. He can't go into Eretz Yisrael because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And the very powerful message here is that even to a rock, you have to speak. Even to a stubborn, hard-headed Jew, with a heart cop, the way to reach him is not to hit him over the head, but to talk to him and to talk nicely. And the question has been asked, why then, earlier in the Chumash, did Hashem in fact tell Moshe when they needed water earlier, he told him to hit the rock? which is one of the explanations why Moshe made this mistake, because once upon a time Hashem did tell him to hit the rock. So he thought maybe he has to do it now too. Why then did Hashem tell him to hit it and now he tells him to speak to the rock? And one answer, a beautiful answer, is because that was in the beginning of Moshe's leadership. He was still dealing with the original generation 
those who were the slaves who left Egypt. This is now the next generation, their children. They're already poised to enter Eretz Yisrael. That older generation of slaves were beaten badly. They tasted the whip all too often. The hitting and beating were only too commonplace for them. But not this new generation. They were born and raised in freedom. No whips, no slavery, no back-breaking bondage. You want to communicate with this generation? Hitting them won't work. It'll only backfire. And it's the same for us today. How can we win the war against assimilation? Not with the old fire and brimstone of yesterday. That's not going to work with this generation. You have to speak to the rock nicely. You have to be a friend. Chabad is uncompromising in our adherence to the higher standards of halacha and Yiddishkeit, and at the very same time, unconditionally loving and accepting of every Jew, regardless of where they're at on the religious spectrum. So a is going to go to a college campus in America, and he's going to shout at the Jewish students for eating treif. That would be a disaster. On the contrary, what do they do? They reach out to them and they offer to them a delicious hot kosher meal at the Chabadas every Shabbos as hundreds of Chabad on campus shluchim are doing around the world every single Shabbos. They are speaking to those rocks. You know, in the olden days when I first started as a rabbi, Jews appreciated, Jews who came to shul actually appreciated a powerful drosha where the rabbi did give fire and brimstone. As long as it was not directed at them, of course. You know, he was talking about somebody else. That's great. Today, I don't think people come to shul for a sermon. They come to socialize with their mates, to have a lachayim during the haftorah, a new custom. You heard about that minute again? You can't shout at these people. You can't hit them over the head. You have to talk to them nicely and gently. Love and friendship are the only things that work today. And no one understood this better than the Rebbe, even 70 years ago, post-Holocaust, American Jews, born in the USA, land of the free, home of the brave. The Rebbe knew that the way to reach Yidin is through Avas Yisrael and unconditional love. And I share with you a story that remarkably only became, was discovered a few short years ago but it happened back in the 40s with two people who I knew very well personally. They were my father's generation. They were friends of my father, Rabbi Herschel Folgeman and Rabbi David Edelman, who were shluchim in Massachusetts and Worcester and Springfield, Massachusetts, respectively. And they were bochrim in 770 in the yeshiva in the mid-40s, <coughs> late 40s. And one day, the Rebbe who was not yet the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe was still alive, the Rebbe walked out of the elevator right in the entrance of 770. Those of you who have been there know what I'm talking about. The Rebbe came out of the elevator from upstairs. He had been to the previous Rebbe's room. And he sees these two young yeshiva bochim, Fogelman and Edelman, standing there. And the Rebbe was quite excited. And he says to them, <coughs> you want to hear a fresh vort from the Rebbe? From the Rebbe Rayatz? He said, of course. And he told him this. He said, you know, I am friendly to all Yidin. Even those who are not from, or even those who used to be from and dropped it when they came to America. I'm friendly to them all. But some of the older Hasidim were not so happy with my approach. And they criticized me. They said, I'm wrong. They said, I have to be stern with these people and be rebuking them. So I thought, maybe they're right. They're older chassidim, maybe they're right. So I asked the Rebbe. I asked the Rebbe. This is my way. This is what I hear from older chassidim. What is the right way? What should I do? And this is what the Friedrich Rebbe said to me just a moment ago. He said, every parent loves his children every child, with an infinite love. But sometimes a child has a challenge, a problem. Might be a health problem, IQ, EQ, 
educational, emotional. Today we have a name for it, special needs. And the parent loves that child with a special love, a unique love. They love every one of their children, but that child gets a unique love. And the Friyaka Rebbe continued. He says to the Rebbe, Hashem is our Father in heaven. And He too loves every one of His children. But a child who has a special challenge, even if a Yid is spiritually challenged, His Father in heaven loves him with a special love. So you said the previous Rebbe to our Rebbe, should continue to behave like Hashem, as you've been doing. Continue to love every Yid regardless. And if a Yid is spiritually challenged, then love him even more. And it's very possible that this had a big influence on the Rebbe in formulating his whole philosophy and his whole way of life and his whole rabbistva, as he made this his life's mission for the next half a century. My friends, we know that we have a problem today. We have a serious problem. The whole from world has a problem. Where children are nebuch dropping out, off the derech, so to speak, too many of them. And what should we do? with these children of ours. So I'd like to suggest that the Rebbe would say, we should, we should love them even more. And that will be the way to bring them back. I'll share with you a story that I heard in the name of an old friend of mine who was with me in Yeshiva in Canada, who is today a respected educator here in Israel, Reb Shia Weber who was at an educational conference here in Israel. And one of the participants is a teacher in a Jerusalem cheder in the, the very religious quarters of Yerushalayim here. And he told this following story. He said, a young student of his was Nebuch orphaned of his mother. You can imagine. The house and the family were really shaken up. It's traumatized. It didn't take very long and the father remarried. And for this child in particular, it wasn't working out. And he started acting out in school. And he became difficult and impossible to discipline and control in school and he was just laying there on the desk, he wouldn't listen, he wouldn't respond. And the teacher tried everything and he was at his wit's end, so he went to talk to his principal, what to do with this kid. And the principal said, look, we know it's a Rachmanus, he's never chayosim. He lost his mother, it's very sad, but we cannot tolerate such behavior. Give him a frask, a little corporal punishment, old fashioned. Somehow the teacher could not bring himself to take the principal's advice. So he's thinking what to do. So the kid is laying there, sprawled over his desk, and the teacher writes a little note with two words and puts it on the boy's desk. What are the two words? Ma shlom cha. How you doing? After a while, the kid notices the note realizes it came from the teacher, and he writes back a note. Also two words, ra li, things are bad for me. Teacher gets the note, and he writes back a response, also two words, ani mevin, I understand. It wasn't a dramatic overnight transformation, but it was a turning point. From that moment, the kids started responding, and gradually, slowly, over time, he recovered. And he became a regular student, and he was doing fine. 
Many years later, the teacher concludes this story. I'm walking in the streets of Jerusalem and I see a young man with a young woman pushing a little carriage with a baby. And I recognize this is that boy from that story. And I'm so excited. I haven't seen him in so long. And, I, and I'm so happy that he's married and he's got a child and he's straightened out, thank God. And he went over to him and they embraced. And the teacher said, how did you manage? And the young man took out his wallet from his pocket. And he took out three crumpled pieces of paper. Mashlomcha, rali, ani mevin. And he said, whenever I had a rough patch in my life, I pulled out these papers and it helped me get through it. Thank you. And the principal, the teacher is telling the story at the education conference. And he says, thank God I didn't take the principal's advice. I didn't give him a frask, a clap. I tried to love him more. And that is what the Rebbe taught us. And so my friends, we are here commemorating Gimel Tammuz. The Rebbe's 28th yard site tomorrow night in Shabbos. And the hour is late. I could share much more with you on the Rebbe's Shittah of Avis Yisrael. But I'm going to end with one final personal story. And I want to say to you that you don't have to think that it's only the shluchim, the rabbis, the rebetzins, the professionals who can do the work of bringing people closer. It is something that each and every one of us can do and must do. Each and every one of us must join the Rebbe's army. Because not every rabbi, not everybody, every shliach can reach. Every one of you has your own sphere of influence. And when you will inspire a Jew, guess what? That will inspire you in turn. And we see it every day. How people who do the Rebbe's work, helping others, help themselves in the process, spiritually and physically. Every one of us can reach out and touch people. And it's not just for them, it's for you. The way to get inspired ourselves is to inspire others. And so I end with a personal story. <clears throat> My wife and I are, Baruch Hashem, the proud parents of 11 children. Kenein Hora, a few grandchildren. When our 10th child was being born, and Alex Claire asked me to give a gurus to that particular child. When my tenth, our 10th tenth child was being born, my wife went into labor, I took her to the hospital, and the doctor, after a while examining her, comes and speaks to me, he says, we have a problem. The baby is lying transverse. That means horizontally, not vertically for a delivery. He's an experienced obstetrician. He says, if it was breech, feet first, no problem. I do that all the time. But it's transverse. There's no way. We have to do a cesarean, a C-section. Tell your wife. I tell my wife, my wife has a lot more emuna and betochen than I do. She says, what are you talking about? I've had nine natural deliveries. I'm not having a cesarean now. It's shnas arenu niflois. It was then. A year of wonders and miracles. I'm not having a Caesar. I went back to the doctor. He didn't know what to do. He's never had such a patient before. <laughs> so for the first time in his career, he called in a second opinion. This is one o'clock in the morning, and he calls in 
So the doctor, our doctor was a guy, Dr. Chaim Neifeld, all of us show him. And he calls in Dr. Ronnie Klein. Second opinion, a highly thought of, respected obstetrician, gynecologist. He comes in one o'clock in the morning, he examines my wife. They try to turn, to manipulate. At the late stage, it's very difficult. They can't, he goes back to this transverse position, a stubborn kid, you know. And the second opinion confirms what the first opinion said. But the second doctor, Dr. Ronnie Klein, says to me, after concurring with the first opinion, he says, but why don't you call New York? He's a not, not, not a frum man, but clearly he's had some experience with the Rebbe's answers. And clearly New York, he means the Rebbe. Now it's one o'clock in the morning, the switchboard is closed, the cell phones have not been invented yet. This is over 30 years ago. They opened the switchboard for me. I managed to get a hold of my father. He ran to 770. He lives in Crown Heights, lived in Crown Heights. My father, Rosh Hashanah. The Rebbe was just coming back from the oil, Rabbi Grona. Rosh went to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said as follows. Since the doctor suggested to ask here, I trust he will not have faribl. He will not bear a grudge against me if I suggest we should listen to the Kimpatoran, that's the woman in labor, and we should wait. Now the doctors said they were picking up stress levels and they were afraid to wait, but the Rebbe said, so they waited, and lo and behold, miracle of miracles, wonder of wonders, Shnasai Dona this little kid, turned on his own into a head-first position and was delivered naturally. Baruch Hashem. And we called this little boy Nissen. Not only that I had an uncle Nissen, all of us show him, Nissen Gordon, but because of the Nissen, the miracles that surrounded his birth. And today, this little Nissen is a shliach, the rabbi of Chabad on campus in Cape Town. And so, my friends, we salute the rabbi's vision, dedication, humanity, Rabbi Kanteman, we discussed this yesterday, he pointed out not only the Rebbe's vision, but his deep sensitivity to the doctor. He didn't just tell him, listen to the mother. He said, as you suggested to ask here, very, with deference to the doctor, very sensitive. It shows the Rebbe's vision and his humanity. And so, we salute that vision, dedication, humanity, love, and leadership. And please, God, all of us will honor the Rebbe's yard site by reaching out to another Yid in one way or another, inspiring them and inspiring ourselves. I want to give a big yashikayach to the cantonments for their beautiful work, for a beautiful evening. And I mentioned to someone else the other day that I'm coming to speak for the cantonments. They said, oh, they do wonderful work. They have a giant menorah on Hanukkah, which is a real Kiddush Hashem every year. And Rabbi Eli already mentioned at the beginning that it was Rabbi Nit Chani who was mainly behind tonight's event. God should bless you with continued nachas from your beautiful family. My friends, please God, with all our combined efforts, it will take help bring Mashiach now. And it'll be this year in Jerusalem with the Rebbe leading us to the Gula with Mashiach Tzitkenu from Heidu Mamish Omen. Thank you.